with the edge of his hand. He sawed away at his stomach and squinted. What will you do then? Asked Rusonov in amazement. Not a thing. I'll just have to get used to it. As long as it still soaks up the vodka. But you have such wonderful self-control. Listen to me, neighbor. Charlie nodded his head up and down. His face with its big reddish nose was kindness itself. Simplicity shone in his eyes. If you don't want to croak, you shouldn't get yourself upset. Less talk, less pain. That's my advice to you. At the moment, Amajan appeared with a board made of plywood. They set it up between Rasanov and Charlie's beds. It was quite firm. That's more civilized, said Amajan happily. Turn on the light, Charlie ordered. They turned on the light. The room brightened up. Well, what about a fourth? But there was no fourth to be found. Never mind. Explain it to us, said Rusonov. He was becoming quite cheerful. There he sat, legs on the floor, just like a healthy man. When he turned his head, the pain in his neck was much less than before. Maybe it was only a piece of board, but he imagined himself sitting at a nice little card table with a cheerful, bright lamp shining from the ceiling. The signs of the gaily inscribed red and black suits stood out sharp and precise on the polished white surfaces of the cards. Maybe Charlie was right. Maybe if you tackled your illness the way he did, it would slip away of its own accord. Why mope? Why go around with gloomy thoughts all the time? We wait longer, yes. Amajan was as eager as the rest now. Look at this, Charlie let the whole pack slip through his sure fingers with the speed of a film strip. The unnecessary ones he discarded to one side, the others he stacked in front of him. The cards we use are from the ace down to nine. Here's the order of the suits. Clubs, then diamonds, then hearts, then spades. He pointed the suits out to Amajan. Do you understand? Yes, sir, I understand. Amajan answered with great satisfaction. Maxim Petrovich bent the chosen part of the pack between his fingers, flipped through it, shuffled it lightly, and went on explaining. Each man gets five cards. The rest are for drawing. Now you must learn the order of the hands. These are the combinations. One pair, he showed them, two pairs. A straight, that's five cards in a sequence. Like this or like that, then threes, full house. Which one's Charlie? Someone asked, appearing in the doorway. Get on parade, your wife's here. Did she bring a bag by any chance? All right, boys, take a break. He walked boldly and nonchalantly toward the door. It became quite quiet in the ward. The lights were burning as though it was evening. Amajan went off to his own bunk. Nalia carried on slopping water quickly across the floor, so everyone had pulled their feet up onto their beds. Pavel Nikolaevich lay down. He could physically feel that eagle owl staring at him from the corner, like a stubborn, reproachful pressure on the side of his head. To relieve the pressure, he asked him, What's the matter with you then, comrade? But the gloomy old man would not make even the merest polite gesture in answer to the question. It was as if it had never been asked. His huge round eyes, red and tobacco, brownish, seemed to stare straight past Pavel Nikolaevich's head. After waiting for an answer, but not getting one, Pavel Nikolaevich had started flipping the glossy cards through his hands when he heard the man's hollow voice. The usual, he said. What was the usual? 
boorish fellow. This time Pavel Nikolaevich did not even look at him. He lay down on his back and just stayed like that, lying there and thinking. The arrival of Charlie and the cards had distracted him, but of course the newspapers were what he was really waiting for. Today was a memorable day. March 5, 1955 was the second anniversary of Stalin's death. A very significant day for the future, and there was a lot he ought to be working out and deducing from the newspapers. Because your country's future is, after all, your own future as well. Would the whole paper carry a black morning edge? Or just the first page? Would there be a full-page portrait or only a quarter-page one? And what would be the wording of the headlines of the leading article? After the February dismissals, this was particularly important. If he'd been at work, Pavel Nikolaevich could have gathered the news from someone. But here, all he had was the newspaper. Nelia was fussing and pushing between the beds. None of the spaces between them was wide enough for her, but she did the washing quite quickly. In no time, she was finished and rolling out the strip of carpet. Then in walked Vadim along the strip on his way back from the x-ray room. He was carefully nursing his bad leg, his lips twitching with the pain. He had the newspaper. Pavel Nikolaevich beckoned him over. Vadim, he said, come over here, sit down. Vadim hesitated, thought for a minute, turned and walked into Rasanov's bed space. He sat down, holding his trouser leg to stop it chafing. It was obvious that Vadim had already opened the paper, because it wasn't folded as a fresh paper would be. Even while he was taking hold of the paper, Pavel Nikolaevich could see at once that there were no borders around the edges, and no portrait in the first column. He looked more closely, rustling hurriedly through the pages, on and on, but however far he looked, he could not find a portrait, a black border, or a big headline anywhere. In fact, it looked as though there wasn't even an article. There's nothing in it, is there? He asked Vadim. He was frightened and neglected to say exactly what there was, nothing of. He scarcely knew Vadim. Although the man was a party member, he was still too young, not a leading official, but a narrow specialist. And what might be tucked away inside his head, it was impossible to guess. But on one occasion, he had given Pavel Nikolaevich excellent grounds for hope. The men in the ward were talking about the exiled nationalities. Vadim had raised his head from his geology, looked at Rasonov, shrugged his shoulders and said so quietly that only Rasonov could hear. There must have been something in it. They wouldn't exile people for nothing in our country. By making such a correct observation, Vadim had shown himself a thoroughly intelligent man of unshakable principles. It seemed that Pavel Nikolaevich had not been mistaken. He did not have to explain what he was talking about. Vadim had already looked for it himself. He indicated the special feature which Pavel Nikolaevich, overcome by emotion, had not spotted. It was an ordinary feature, quite undistinguished from the others. No picture, just an article by a member of the Academy of Sciences. And the article itself was not about the second anniversary or about the whole nation's grief. Nor did it say he was alive and will live forever. It merely said Stalin and some problems of communist construction. There's an asterisk next to that communist construction. The word construction is here used in the communist sense of constructing a new society. I think we could have guessed that one. Was that all? Just some problems? Just those few problems? Problems of construction? Why construction? They might as well be writing about protective forest belts. Two asterisks next to this. A feature of Stalin's plan for the transformation of nature, the last of his grandiose schemes. It has now been abandoned. 
What about the military victories? What about the, the philosophical genius? What about the giant of the sciences? What about the entire people's love for him? Knitting his brow, Pavel Nikolaevich gazed sufferingly through his spectacles at the swarthy face of Vadim. How could it happen, eh? He peered cautiously over his shoulder at Kostoglotov, who seemed to be asleep. His eyes were shut and his head was hanging down from the bed as usual. Two months ago, just two months, isn't that right? You remember, his 75th birthday. Everything the way it always has been. A huge picture and a huge headline. The great successor. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? It wasn't the danger, no. It wasn't the danger that now threatened those who were left after his death. It was the ingratitude. It was this ingratitude that wounded Rusanov most of all, as though his own great services, his own irreproachable record, were what they were spitting on and trampling underfoot. If the glory that resounds in eternity could be muffled and cut short after only two years, if the most beloved, the most wise, the one whom all your superiors and superiors' superiors obeyed could be overturned and hushed up within twenty-four months, then what remained? What could one rely on? How could a man recover his health in such circumstances? You see, Vadim said very softly, officially there was an order issued recently to commemorate only the anniversaries of births, not those of deaths. But of course, to judge from the article, he shook his head sadly from side to side. He too felt somehow insulted, most of all because of his late father. He remembered how his father loved Stalin. He'd loved him much more than he'd loved himself. His father never tried to get anything for himself, more even than he loved Lenin, probably more than he'd loved his wife and his sons. He could speak calmly or jokingly about his family, but about Stalin, never. His voice would shake at the mention of him. He had one portrait of Stalin hanging in his study, one in the dining room, and yet another in the nursery. As the boys grew up, they always saw hanging over them those thick eyebrows, that thick mustache, that firm, steadfast face, seemingly incapable either of fear or of frivolous joy, all emotions seeming concentrated in those glittering velvety black eyes. Every time Stalin made a speech, his father would first read it right through, then read pieces aloud to the boys, explaining how profound their thought was, how subtly it was expressed, and how fine the Russian was. Only later, when his father was no longer alive, and Vadim was grown up, did he begin to find the language of the speeches a trifle insipid. He began to feel the thought was not concentrated at all, that it could have been set out much, much more concisely and that judging by the volume of words, there should have been more of it. Despite his discovery, he would never have spoken of it aloud. He still felt himself a more complete person when professing the admiration instilled in him as a child. It was still quite fresh in his memory, the day of Stalin's death. They had wept, old people, young people, and children. Girls burst into sobs, and young men were wiping their eyes. To judge from the widespread tears, you would think that a crack had appeared in the universe, rather than that one man had died. He felt that if humanity was able to survive this day, it would for centuries be carved in man's memory as the blackest day of the year. And now, on its second anniversary, they wouldn't even spend a drop of printer's ink giving him a black border. They couldn't find the simple words of warmth. Two years ago, there passed away. The man whose name was the last earthly word uttered by countless soldiers as they stumbled and fell 
in the Great War. But it was not merely a question of Vadim's upbringing. He might have outgrown that. No, the fact was that all reasonable considerations demanded that one honor the great man who had passed away. He had been clarity itself, radiating confidence in the fact that tomorrow would not depart from the path of the preceding day. He had exalted science, exalted scientists, and freed them from the petty thoughts of salary or accommodations. Science itself required his stability and his permanence to prevent any catastrophe happening that might distract science, that might distract scientists or take them away from their work, which was of supreme interest and use for settling squabbles about the structure of society, for educating the underdeveloped, or for convincing the stupid. Vadim walked miserably back to his bed, nursing his bad leg. Then Charlie reappeared, very pleased with himself, carrying a bag full of provisions. He put them into his bedside table, on the side, away from Rasanov's bed space, and smiled at him sheepishly. The last time I'll have something to eat with. Goodness knows what it will be like when I have nothing left but guts. Rusanov couldn't have admired Charlie more. What an optimist he was. What an excellent fellow. Pickled tomatoes. Charlie carried on unpacking. He pulled one straight out of the jar with his fingers, swallowed it, and screwed up his eyes. Ah, they're delicious, he said. And a piece of veal, all juicy and fried, not dried up. He felt it and licked his fingers. The golden hands of a woman. Slightly, he slid a half-liter bottle of spirit into his bedside table. Rusanov saw him. Although Charlie's body screened what he was doing from the rest of the room, he winked at Rusanov. So, you're a local boy, are you? said Pavel Nikolaevich. No, I am not local. I just pass through here sometimes on business. But your wife lives here, does she? But Charlie was already out of earshot. Taking away the empty bag, he came back, opened the bedside table, screwed up his eyes, had a look, swallowed one more tomato, and closed the door. He shook his head from side to side with pleasure. Well, what did we stop for? Let's get on with it. By this time, Amajan had found a fourth, a young Kazakh from out on the staircase. He had spent the time sitting on his bed heatedly, gesticulating and telling the Kazakh in Russian the story of how our Russian boys beat the Turks. He had gone to another wing the previous evening and seen a movie there called The Capture of Plevna. Plevna was captured by the Russians in the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-78. The irony is that both Amajan and his partner belong to Turkic nations and can understand one another's dialect. Both men now came over and set the board up again between the beds. Charlie, even merrier than before, dealt out some cards with his quick, clever hands to show his friends some examples. Now that's a full house. Do you see? That's when you get three of one kind and two of another. Do you see? Shekmek. Do you see Shekmek? Shekmek is a racially insulting word for Uzbeks used by Russians. So says the asterisk. I'm no Shekmek, said Amajan, shaking his head but not taking offense. I was a Shekmek before I joined the army. All right, fine, now. The next one's a flush. That's when all five are the same suit. Then we have fours. Four of the same kind, with an odd one out as fifth. Then straight flush. That's a straight of the same suit, from nine to the king. Here, look, like this. Or like this. Then higher still is the royal straight flush. 
Of course, it wasn't all clear at once, but Maxim Petrovich promised them it would be when they actually started. The main thing was that he talked so amiably, in such a straightforward, sincere tone of voice that it made Pavel Nikolaevich's heart warm to hear him. He had never counted on meeting such a pleasant, obliging fellow in a public hospital. Here they were sitting together, a nice, friendly little cell, and so it would go on hour after hour, perhaps every day. Why bother about illness? Why think about unpleasant facts? Maxim Petrovich was right. Rusanov was just about to stipulate that they wouldn't play for money until they had properly mastered the game, when suddenly someone appeared in the doorway. Which of you is Charlie? he asked. I'm Charlie. Get on parade, your wife's here. Ah, silly bitch, Maxim Petrovich spat with malice. I told her, don't come on Saturday, come on Sunday. She nearly bumped into the other one, didn't she? Oh, well, friends, you'll have to excuse me. Ooh, he's got two wives. So the game was disrupted again. Maxim Petrovich went off, and Imagine and the Kazakh took the cards across their corner to go through them and practice. And once more, Pavel Nikolaevich thought about his tumor, and about March the 5th. Again, he could feel the eagle owl staring at him disapprovingly from the corner. He turned round and was hit by the open eye of Boneshewer. Boneshewer had not been asleep at all. Kostoglatov had been awake all that time. Rusanov and Vadim had been rustling through the paper and whispering to each other, and he had heard every word. He had deliberately not opened his eyes. He wanted to hear what they would say about it, and what Vadim would say about it. He didn't need to fight for the paper, open it and read it, because everything was already explained. More knocking. His heart was knocking. His heart was banging against an iron door, which ought never to open. His heart was banging against an iron door, which ought never to open, but which was now, for some reason, emitting faint creaks. It was beginning to shake slightly, and rust was beginning to flake off the hinges. Kostoglatov found it impossible to comprehend what he had heard from men in the outside world, that on this day, two years ago, old men had shed tears, young girls had wept, and the whole world had seemed orphaned. He found this preposterous to imagine because he remembered what the day had been like for them. Suddenly they were not taken out to their daily work. Barracks blocked were not unlocked, and the prisoners were kept shut up. The loudspeaker just outside the campgrounds, which they could always hear, had been turned off. Altogether it showed that the bosses had lost their heads, and that they had some great trouble on their hands. And the bosses' troubles meant the prisoners' delight. No need to go to work, just lie on your bunk, all rations delivered to the door. First, they had a good sleep. Then they wondered what was happening. Then they played their guitars and bandoras for a bit. Bandores, that's Spanish. Then they played their guitars and bandors for a bit, then went from bunk to bunk trying to guess what had happened. You can dump prisoners in any out-of-the-way place you like, but somehow the truth will get through to them every time, via the bread-cutting room or the water-boiling room or the kitchen. So the news spread and spread. Not very decisively at first, people were moving along the bunks, not sitting down on them, and saying, Hey, kids, it looks like the old cannibal has kicked the bucket. What did you say? I'll never believe it. About time. And a chorus of laughter. Bring out your guitars. Strum your balalaikas. They didn't open the barracks blocks for 24 hours, but the next morning, it was still frosty in Siberia, the whole camp was formed up in ranks on parade. The major both captains and the lieutenants, everyone was there. The major, somber with grief. 
began to announce. It is with deep sorrow that I must tell you that yesterday in Moscow... And they all started to grin. They were all but openly crowing in the triumph. Those coarse, sharp-boned, swarthy prisoners' mugs. The Major saw them as they started to smile. Beside himself, he ordered caps off. Hundreds of men hesitated on the verge of obeying. To refuse to take them off was still out of the question. But to take them off was too painfully ignominious. One man showed them the way. The camp joker. The popular humorist. He tore off his cap. It was a stalinka made of artificial fur. And hurled it up into the air. He had carried out the order. Hundreds of prisoners saw him. They too threw their caps in the air. The major choked. And now, after all this, Kostogotov was finding out that old men had shed tears. Young girls had wept. And the whole world had seemed orphaned. Charlie came back looking even merrier than before. Once again, with a bag full of provisions but a different one this time. Someone grinned, but Charlie himself was the first one to laugh openly. Well, he said, what can you do with these women? Why not if it gives them pleasure? Why not if it gives them pleasure? Why not comfort them? What harm does it do? Kitchen maid or lady muck? They're all the same. They like a fuck. He burst into loud laughter, in which his listeners joined. With a gesture, Charlie waved away the surfeit of laughter. Uh, Rusanov too, joined in the good, honest laughter. It sounded so clever, the way Maxim Petrovich had said it. So your wife... Which one's she? asked Amajan, choking with mirth. Don't ask me that, brother, sighed Maxim Petrovich. He was transferring the food into the He was transferring the food into the bedside table. We need a reform in the law. The mausoleum the Moslem arrangements much more humane. And as from last August they're allowing abortions again. That'll make life much more simple. Why should a woman live on her own? Someone ought to visit her even if it is only once or twice a year. It's useful for people traveling on business, too. It's nice to have a room in every town where you can get chicken and noodles. Once again, a dark bottle of something flashed into the closet of provisions. Charlie closed the door and took away the empty bag. Obviously, he wasn't going to pamper this one with his attention. He came straight back. He stopped in the aisle where Yefram had once stood, looked at Rusanov and scratched the curls at the back of his neck. His hair grew quite wild, its color a cross between flax and straw. How about a bite to eat, neighbor? Pavel Nikolaevich smiled sympathetically. The ordinary lunch was a bit late, and he didn't really want to eat it after seeing Maxim Petrovich laughingly handling each piece of food he'd been brought. There was something agreeable, something of the flesh-eater about Maxim Petrovich, and the way his fat lips smiled, it made one feel drawn towards sitting down with him at a dinner table. All right, Rusanov invited him to come to his table. I've got a few things in here, too. What about glasses? Charlie leaned across, and his agile hands carried the jugs and parcels across to Rusanov's table. But we're not allowed to, said Pavel Nikolaevich, shaking his head. With our disease, it's strictly forbidden to... During the past month, no one in the ward had even dared to think of doing this, but, but with Charlie, it seemed natural and unavoidable. What's your name? He was already across in Rusanov's bed space, sitting opposite him, knee to knee. Pavel Nikolaevich. Pasha. Charlie laid a friendly hand on Rusanov's shoulder. You mustn't listen to the doctors. They'll cure you, but they'll lead you to the grave. 
What we want is to live and to keep our tails up. Charlie's artless face with its big, ruddy nose and fat, juicy lips shone with friendliness and firm conviction. It was Saturday in the clinic, and all treatments were held over until Monday. Outside for the graying windows, outside the graying windows, the rain poured down, cutting Rusonov off from friends and family. The newspaper had no mourning portrait and a murky resentment congealed in his soul. The bright lamps were shining, switch on well before the start of the long, long evening. The bright lamps were shining, switched on well before the start of the long, long evening. He could now sit with his agreeable man, have a drink, have a bite to eat, and then play some poker. Poker. What a piece of gossip for Pavel Nikolaevich's friends. Charlie, the artful dodger, already had his bottle under the pillow. With one finger, he knocked off the stopper and poured out half a glass each, holding the bottle down by their knees. They held the glasses down there and clinked them together. Like a true Russian, Pavel Nikolaevich now scorned his former fears, reservations, and vows. All he wanted was to swill the despair out of his soul and feel a little warmth. We'll have a good time. We'll have a good time, Pasha. Charlie impressed it in him. Charlie impressed it on him. His funny old face became filled with sternness, ferocity even. Let the others croak if they want to. You and I will have a good time. They drank to that. Rusanov had grown much weaker over the past month. He has drunk nothing but weak red wine, so now he was on fire at once. As each minute passed, the heat dissolving and floating through his body, convincing him that it was no use hanging your head, that people managed to live even in the cancer ward, and then leave it behind them. Do they hurt a lot, then? These polyps? He asked. Yes, a bit, but I don't give in, Pasha. Vodka can't make it any worse. You've got to realize that. Vodka's a cure for all illnesses. I'll drink some pure spirit before the operation. What do you think? Here, I've got it in a little bottle. Why spirit? Why spirit? Because it gets absorbed right away. It doesn't leave any surplus water. When the surgeon turns out my stomach, There'll be nothing there. Clean as a whistle. And I'll be drunk. You fought at the front yourself, didn't you? You know how it is. Before an attack, they give you vodka. Were you wounded? No. Bad luck. I was twice. Look here and here. Another hundred grams of liquid had appeared in each glass. We shouldn't have any more, said Pavel Nikolaevich, resisting mildly. It's dangerous. What's so dangerous? What's put the idea into your head that it's dangerous? Have some tomatoes. Ah, tomatoes. And indeed, what difference was there? A hundred or two hundred grams? Once you'd gone over the edge anyway. And indeed, what is the difference? And indeed, what difference was there? A hundred or two hundred grams? Once you've gone over the edge anyway, 200 or 250 grams, what did it matter if the great man had died and they were now going to ignore him? Pavel Nikolaevich downed another glass in memory of the leader. He drank as though drinking at a wake, and his lips twisted sadly. Then he stuffed little tomatoes between them. The two men leaned forward foreheads almost touching, and he listened to Maxim Petrovich sympathetically. Yes, lovely and red, Maxim declared. Here, there, a ruble, a kilo, but take them up to Karaganda, and you can get thirty. But they tear them out of your hands. You aren't allowed to take them, though. The baggage car won't accept them. Why won't they, eh? You tell me. Why won't they? Maxim Petrovich 
grew quite excited. His eyes widened. Where's the sense of it? They seemed to imply the sense of existence. A little man in an old jacket comes into the station master's office. You want to live, do you, chief? The station master grabs the telephone. He thinks they've come to kill him. But the man slaps 300 ruble notes down on the table. Why won't you let me do it? He asks. Why all this? Not allowed. Why won't you let me do it? He asks. Why all this? Not allowed. You want to live? I want to live too. Tell them to take my basket into the baggage car. Life will conquer, you see, Pasha. Off goes the train. They call it a passenger train, and it's full of tomatoes, baskets of them, on the racks and under the racks too. The guard gets his cut, ticket collector gets his cut. When we cross the railway boundaries, they put on new ticket collectors and they get their cut too. Rusanov's head was beginning to spin. He was glowing with warmth and felt he was stronger than his illness now. Maxim seemed to be saying something that didn't tie up with... that went right against... That's against the rules, objected Pavel Nikolaevich. What do you do it for? It's not right. Not right? Charlie was quite amazed. Try the dill pickle, then. And some caviar. In Karaganda, there's an inscription, stone inlaid on stone. Coal is bread. Bread for industry, that is. But when it comes to tomatoes for the people, there just aren't any. And there won't be any unless businessmen bring them. People snap them up at 25 a kilo and give you a thank you into the bargain. At least they get a few tomatoes that way. Otherwise they would get nothing. They are real morons out there in Karaganda. You can't imagine. They get squads of guards and muscle men together and instead of sending them out to get apples and bring them in by the wagon load, they post them on every road in the steppe to catch the men who are trying to bring apples to Karaganda, to stop them getting through. And they just stand there and guard. Stupid fools. You do it, do you? Pavel Nikolaevich was distressed. Why me? I don't carry baskets around. Pasha, I've got my briefcase and my suitcase. Train tickets are always sold out, always. I don't knock on the glass window. I can always get on the train. I know who to go to at every station, how to find where the right tea brewer or baggage man is. Life will always conquer, Pasha. Remember that. But what do you do exactly? What's your job? Me? I'm a technician, Pasha. Even though I didn't finish technical school, I do a bit of middleman work on the side. I do it so I can always have a bit left in my pocket. And when they stop paying the right money, I leave and go somewhere else. See? Pavel Nikolaevich was beginning to realize that things weren't turning out quite as they ought to be. It wasn't proper. In fact, it was wrong. But Maxim was such a pleasant, merry fellow, you felt at home with him. The first one he'd met in a whole month. He didn't have the heart to hurt him. But is it right, what you're doing? Pavel Nikolaevich pressed him. It's all right. It's fine, said Maxim, reassuringly. Now have a bit of this delicious veal. We'll guzzle some of your compote in a minute. You see, Pasha, we only live once, so why not live well? What we want to do is live well. Pavel Nikolaevich could not help agreeing with this. Maxim was quite right. We only live once, so why not live well? It was just that. You see, Maxim, people don't approve of... He reminded him gently, Well, Pasha, he answered as amiably as ever, gripping him by the shoulder. That depends on how you look at it. It's one thing here, 
another thing somewhere else. A mote in the eye makes everyone cry, but no woman's hurt by a yard up her skirt. Charlie was roaring with laughter and slapping Rusanov on the knee. Rusanov could not contain himself. He shook with laughter, too. Hey, you know a few funny lines, don't you? You know what you are, Maxim? You're a poet. What are you, then? What's your job? Asked his new friend inquisitively. They were almost embracing each other by now. But at this point, Pavel Nikolaevich unwittingly became rather dignified. His position imposed certain obligations. Well, I'm in personnel. He was being modest, of course. He was higher up than that, really. Where's that? Pavel Nikolaevich told him. Listen, said Maxim delightedly. I know a good man we ought to try and arrange something for. As for the entrance fee, that will come through as usual. Don't you worry about that. What do you mean? How can you think that? Pavel Nikolaevich took offense. What is there to think? said Charlie in surprise. And again, that search for the meaning of life could be seen trembling in his eyes. Only this time slightly blurred with drink. If the personnel boys didn't take entrance fees, what do you think they would live on? What would they bring their children up on? How many children have you got? Have you finished with the paper? came a hollow, unpleasant voice from above their heads. Eagle Owl had dragged himself out of his corner, his eyes harsh and swollen, and his dressing gown wide open. It turned out that Pavel Nikolaevich was sitting on the paper. It was all crumpled. Certainly, by all means, said Charlie at once, pulling the paper out from under Rusana. Move over there, Pasha. Here you are, Dad. I don't know about anything else, but we won't begrudge you this, will we, Pasha? Gloomily, Shalubin took the paper and made as if to go, but Kostoglatov restrained him. He began to stare at Shalubin in just the same way as Shalubin had been staring at them all, silently and persistently. He examined him and now saw him particularly clearly and closely. Who could this man be? And with such an extraordinary face, he looked like an exhausted actor who had just taken off his makeup. Kostoglatov had picked up a trick of familiarity in the transit prisons, where the first minute you met a man, you could ask him anything you liked. Lying there in his half upside down position, he asked Shalubin, Hey, Dad, what was your job, eh? It wasn't only Shalubin's eyes but his whole head that turned to look at Kostoglatov. For some moments he looked at him unblinkingly, meanwhile twisting his neck in a strange circular movement, as though his collar were too tight. But his collar couldn't have been getting in his way. His nightskirt was quite roomy. This time he didn't ignore the question. A librarian, he answered abruptly. Where? Astogatov grabbed the chance to slip in another question. In an agricultural technical college. For some unknown reason, the heaviness of his gaze, or his owl-like silence as he sat in the corner, Rusanov felt the urge to humiliate him, to put him in his place. Or perhaps it was the vodka speaking inside him. His voice was louder and more frivolous than it need have been, as he said, You're not a party member, are you? Eagle Owl turned his tobacco-brownish eyes on Rusanov. He blinked, as though he couldn't believe the question, and blinked again. Suddenly he opened his beak. On the contrary! And he strode off across the room. His walk was oddly unnatural. Something must have been pricking him, or chafing him somewhere. He hobbled away, the flaps of his dressing gown wide apart, bent forward clumsily, reminding one of a large bird whose wings have been unevenly clipped to prevent it from taking off into the air. That concludes chapter 23 of Cancer Ward. Um, 
we will do chapter 24 tomorrow. That chapter is called The Transfusion of Blood. Thanks for joining me at the Carter Banks Hour. If you'd like to see the previous chapters of this book, all 23 of them are located on my YouTube at youtube.com slash carterbanks. There are two audiobooks there that I've already finished, and this one will eventually be up. Thanks again for joining me, everyone, and have a good night and stay safe.